Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Thanks again, everyone, for being here. Uh, my name is Laurel Ann. Um, I'm here on behalf of the Dance Palace. Thanks um, to the Art Committee for putting this on. We're really excited to have Sarah here with us this month. Um, and yeah, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Carlos Parada, our chair member for the Art Committee. Well, good evening. Um, welcome to our third Dance Palace Community Center's art Artist Reception. Uh, my name is Carlos Porrata, and I'm the current chair of the Dance Palace Art Committee. The Art Committee provides opportunities for local artists that live or work in West Marin and encourages new artists to exhibit their work in our lobby gallery and on a monthly basis. But due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the Dance Palace has been closed for over six months, and we have no idea how long this will go on. As we're unable to meet in person, the Dance Palace has moved classes and events online. This decline in income moved us to rely on donations and invited us to find other ways for artists to exhibit their work and have their artist receptions. Before I introduce our Artist of the Month of December, there are some ground rules I would like to go over with all of you. Uh, LA just went through some of them. I just wanna just do it quickly again one more time. Um, the artist reception will be recorded and uploaded to YouTube. Anyone that does not want to appear in this video should turn their cameras off. Please turn your mics off so that the background noise can be kept to a minimum. The mic is located at the bottom left-hand side of your screen, but I think LA <laughs> muted us all of us anyway. Um, we will try to keep the presentation to one hour. Today, Sarah is going to talk about some of her images and the experience of taking the photos. At the end of each commentary, she will open it to questions. If you have a question, please use the chat option. Laurel Ann Riley, our Dance Palace host, will be handling the chat questions. We may not be able to get to all the questions due to the time constraints, but we'll do the best we can. Thanks in advance for keeping these ground rules in mind. So now, let me tell you about our artist of the month. My friend and neighbor, Sarah Killingsworth, is a wildlife educator and wildlife photographer. She has been a part-time Inverness resident since 2012. Her wildlife photography evolved out of a desire to share the encounters with wildlife she had in the Point Reyes National Seizure with a broader community, not just her own family and friends. Like me, Sarah appreciates the restorative power of time in the wilderness, of sitting quietly, observing wildlife. During the spring of 2020, Sarah walked and biked into the Point Reyes National Seizure where she was able to observe and photograph wildlife when few people were in the park. These portraits are a tribute and a testament to that love of wildlife, a quiet communion in the wilderness. Sarah's passionate about education, and loves talking about wildlife and sharing her photography with children, always eager to share the magic of wild places. As a wildlife educator, she has done many classroom presentations as well as webinars and podcasts. In addition to being a wildlife educator with Project Coyote, Sarah is a member of the board of the Environmental Action Committee of West Marin, and she serves on the NANPA Ethics Committee. So, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Sarah Killingsworth. You're Thanks. on, Sarah. All right. Thank you, Carlos. And um, I want to start by um, thanking both Carlos and Laurel Ann for all of your hard work in getting this today set up, and also to the Dance Palace for the opportunity to have an online gallery and reception. I am going to share my screen now, so hopefully that's going to work. Okay, do I get a thumbs up? Everyone can see my screen, hopefully. Yeah, great. We're good. Thank you. So I, as Carlo said, I love sharing my wildlife images and talking about animals. And typically I would love to do that in person, but in 2020, we've all had to adapt and find new ways of doing things. So I wanna thank you for attending a virtual reception. The advantage of doing it this way is that you have your food and beverage of choice at home. You can attend in your sweats or your PJs. And I have some great friends from all across the country who are able to join because we're doing it virtually instead of in person. So thank you all so much for being here. I'm gonna talk a little bit about wildlife photography um, and my wildlife photography generally, and then 
I picked a few of the images in the gallery. And so I'll talk more in detail about those images and how they came about and take questions about them. And then there'll be plenty of time at the end for questions about any of the images in the gallery or anything about my wildlife photography. So um, I got into wildlife photography about five years ago as a result of a fascination with wildlife behavior and particularly wildlife in Point Reyes. I love uh, photographing and spending time with the wildlife in Point Reyes. And the two things that bring me joy in my wildlife photography are the experience of being truly present in the moment with the animals and then being able to share the images and the behavior with the community and with others and hopefully to inspire people to love and protect the wildlife as much as I love them. So today I'm talking about portraits that I took in Point Reyes during the pandemic, but the wildlife that's in these photos is present in suburban and urban areas as well. So there are the same opportunities or very similar opportunities for observing and photographing wildlife in your backyard and in your local park, not just in the Point Reyes National Seashore. Sometimes the wildlife might be a little bit different, but in the Bay Area, honestly, we have bobcats and osprey in suburban neighborhoods as well, not just the park. I chose portraits for this gallery because I thought the intimacy and the quietness of portraits was a really fitting uh, theme for what's been a very unusual and at times destabilizing year. When I've gone to open studios in the past, which is something I love to do, and I always want to hear about what is the artistic process? What is the creative process that the artist goes through in creating their pieces? For me, that's really um, the best part of getting to talk to an artist. And how do you create the work? Wildlife photography is a little bit different um, than painting or sculpting because I don't have a studio per se. I don't um, have the same setup that you might have for some of the other arts. And it's really all outside. So the image on the screen is as close perhaps to the studio as I have other than my laptop when I'm editing photos when I've gotten home. Most of what I do is done outside. And for these photos is all done in Point Reyes. So I thought I could share a little bit about how I create images and uh, generally, and then talk about specific photos. When I'm working on um, wildlife photography or going out to shoot, it's really a combination of wildlife spotting and ob observation techniques, and also then some technical aspects of photography, as well as um, thinking about the creative process and what makes for an image with impact. So I learn something new every time I go out into the park. And if you go out into Point Reyes or into any green space in your neighborhood, you're likely to see wildlife. And if you stop and look carefully, um, depending on visibility, you may wanna have binoculars, but you will find something, a sparrow, um, a coyote, uh, something that you could sit and watch and observe. And once I spot an animal when I'm in the field, I don't ever walk towards it. Because if you do, generally you're going to be perceived as a threat and the animal will run or fly away. That's bad for the animal because it's expending energy. It's also potentially harassing wildlife, which you don't want to do. And it's in the end, not good for photography either, because what you get is the back half of the animal that's running away and you're not going to get good photos if you go chasing after animals that are afraid of you. So one of the first things I always talk to people about who are interested in wildlife photography is just how, how you even approach wildlife and think about taking photos. So really great wildlife photographers study their subjects. They learn how to anticipate an animal's behavior in order to capture stunning images. So knowing the kinds of food that be hunting, knowing the times of day they're going to be active, the seasons or the types of places where they have their young, all of that will help capture better images and allow you to observe better behavior. For me, a really important part of wildlife photography is being quiet. It's showing respect for the animal and the situation and having that internal stillness. It's a lot like a meditation. And I really believe that your energy makes a huge difference in the ability to observe and photograph wildlife. Animals are so attuned to threats that having a calm presence, I think makes an incredibly 
large difference in what you're able to see. So once I'm in the field and I've seen an animal, for me, the next step is to assess the light and figure out a spot that's going to have good light on the animal as well as be a good distance away. And again, sitting quietly, generally not moving. Once I've picked a spot, I tend to stay in it. Um, my goal is really to be invisible. I don't wanna be seen as a threat and I don't wanna attract an animal. I never would call or use bait. Um, I never wanna manipulate the animal's behavior in any way. I really wanna just be a rock in the field, basically, something small and not noticeable. It requires far more time and patience to take photos that way, but sitting quietly is really the best way to get closer images, but also images of really interesting behavior and animals behaving naturally. So hunting, grooming, sleeping, raising their young, all of those things. And when I talk about the photos themselves, you'll see that it looks like I'm very close in those photos, but I'm shooting with a big lens. And when I do classroom presentations, I actually always bring my camera into the classroom and show the kids the camera and say, it's sort of like a telescope. It makes things look much closer than they really are. So uh, that's true for the images in this gallery as well. In talking to Lauren and Carlos and prepping for today, um, Carlos and I just started talking about ethics generally. And Laurel Ann mentioned that it was actually really interesting to her to hear about the ethics in wildlife photography. And so I do think that the concept of not manipulating behavior, not using calls, not using bait, not disrupting the animal's natural patterns, not having it use energy that it needs to conserve for survival um, is all really important. And those ethics are important to me. I think that if you go out and your goal is simply to have the animal perform in a certain way or give you a shot that you really want, it's similar and sort of consistent with the view of our land and environment as something that we extract from, that it's something to take, as opposed to seeing ourselves as one piece of a whole, of an ecosystem in which everything is interconnected and the health of one thing is connected to the health of everything else. And so for me, that respect is really important um, when I go out in the field. So I'm gonna share, before I get into the individual photos, um, I thought it would be fun to have a quick little video of me in the field taking photos with uh, wildlife. So I have a video of me with a coyote, which is now not gonna go, let's see, there we go. Okay, so um, I'm gonna hit play on this and then we'll go into the images, but this is a coyote hunting and then you'll see it sniffing the air. All right, so that's the quick video. Oops, let's go. Okay. <clears throat> the other thing is I've included, um, just because I always like to have Latin names, I've included the Latin names for all the images. So all the species that are being featured in this part of the talk um, have their Latin names um, above the image. So the first image I'm going to talk about is a bobcat. Bobcats are my favorite animal to photograph. I love lots of the animals that I've taken images of um, and put in gallery, but bobcats top the list. They are common in the Bay Area and especially, particularly in Point Reyes, but um, all throughout the Bay Area, in fact. Uh, but they're the ultimate in the disappearing act. They have a spotted coat, which you can see the spots on this cat. And the minute they perceive a threat, they'll hide. And usually that means um, into brush or tall grass. And when bobcats feel threatened, their first defense is to lie flat. And it's amazing how much they can flatten themselves. Um, it's really surprising. And so oftentimes all you'll see is their little black ear tips peeking out of the grass. So a bobcat will perceive a person long before most hikers will see the cat. And so you probably have walked past a bobcat on a hike in Point Reyes and just not known it. Um, you might have seen one in your neighborhoods. Um, this image was taken late in the day, so it was close to sunset. 
And I was driving in the park and saw this bobcat at a distance and decided to get out of my car. I actually take a fair number of my photos from my car. It's a good blind. Um, if the animal is close enough to the road, I'll stay and just shoot from my car. But in this instance, it was a little bit further out. So I got out and walked um, out into the field. And like I said, I would assess the light and figure out a good spot to sit, still a fair distance from the animal. And this bobcat continued hunting the field, was hunting for gophers and walked closer to me as it was hunting. And then it stopped and was going to groom and it had walked to the edge of um, a ravine. So the reason there's such a contrast in this image is the hillside that it's sitting on was still lit by the setting sun and the ravine behind it, the gulch behind it was in the shadow. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the dark background is a function of the shadow which makes for a more dramatic image. But um, just before the bobcat started grooming it looked over its shoulder um, and looked towards the setting sun. And I just, I loved that, loved that look. Okay, so um, LA, do we have any questions about that image coming in? I don't see any questions, but just as a reminder to folks, if you wanna ask questions about anything, <laughs> uh, feel free to write in the chat, um, but no, no questions for now. Okay, cool, then we will move on. Um, okay, so the next image is a peregrine. So this is a peregrine falcon, um, this is the male. And every spring and summer, I love watching um, the fledgling peregrine falcons learn to fly and hunt. We're really lucky to have several pairs in Point Reyes. Uh, in the 1970s, the peregrine falcon population in California was decimated by DDT and other factors. And so they estimated there were only 40 pairs left in the state. And now they estimate there's more than 400. So there's been a remarkable recovery. And they're really beautiful, incredible birds to watch. Um, in this image, um, there's a seagull carcass on the beach, which is sort of um, blurred out from the sand that was blowing the day that I took this. Um, the mother actually had killed the gull and the fledglings had come and eaten some of it. And then this is uh, the dad coming in to see if he can get uh, some of it as well. When the parents hunt before the fledglings are able to hunt for themselves, they will bring a kill to the nest area and the fledglings will flap their wings and call out loudly. It's a raucous um, kind of situation. And so I often don't see the falcon that's coming in yet before the fledglings are making a scene excited about the incoming food, which prompts me to scan the horizon and look for the incoming food. And usually they're carrying a small bird. And as the fledglings learn to fly, the adult will drop. Um, the bird to the fledgling in the air. They'll do an air exchange of food, which is super fun to watch. Um, as we were prepping for today, Carlos was asking uh, whether I was gonna talk about things that were difficult to photograph. And so this is one of the two photos I have that I will say that peregrine falcons, um, everyone probably knows that they're quite speedy. Uh, they are very difficult to photograph because they move so fast. Um, and especially when you have three or four of them, all circling each other and trying to get food from a parent. It's um, an aerial circus moving at, you know, I don't know if it's 100 miles an hour, but it's it's pretty fast. Uh, so it's a tricky thing to photograph. But I love trying to capture them and that behavior. And um, whenever they can come down onto the beach, it's an opportunity to um, get a closer photo like this one, um, which is always really exciting. Okay. I'm gonna move on to... I've got a question here in the sure. chat um, from Nate Love saying, great images. What camera slash lens do you use? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so I shoot um, Nikon and I have two, um, two different camera bodies. So some of these are shot on the D500 and some are on the D850. And then um, most of the close-up type images are shot with a fixed 500 millimeter lens, although I sometimes use a fixed 300. Um, so the equipment varies a little bit depending on the image, but that's a, a short version of the answer. <laughs> All right, any other questions, oh, LA? Well, how about tripod? 
Oh, tripod. Um, <laughs> so um, I do have a tripod. Um, I use it more for taking um, video clips than I do for still photos. But uh, when it comes to still photos, if the tripod is helpful if what you're taking a picture of is relatively stationary. The issue for me with tripods is the faster the thing you're trying to photograph is moving, the harder it is to keep up with it if it's on a tripod. So for things like falcons and weasels, I'll get to the weasel in a little bit, um, I'm always shooting handheld. Um, things like great horned owls, um, or if it's low light, um, so um, the sunset image of a coyote or um, you know, the badger images late in the day or very early in the morning, when I've had to slow the shutter speed way, way down, I will use a tripod just to try and eliminate the shake factor and the blur. But so much of wildlife photography is a relatively fast moving game that um, the tripod is, it, it just depends on the circumstance, but it is important to have a good one because they're very handy when you need them. Awesome. Okay. And I've got another question here in the chat. Okay. Um, from Rich Clark asking, can you guess the F stop and shutter speed of the Falcon shot? Um, usually with a Falcon, I'm shooting at one over 2000 and or one over 2500, it depends. So this one's probably at one over 2000 and probably an f-stop if i had to guess it would be 7.1 um so i can check though <laughs> um okay any other questions before we move to the next picture nope okay as far as the chat it looks like it's it okay uh, this is one of my favorite photos that I took in 2020. Um, badgers have historically been a little bit um, rare for me to find, even in all the hours that I've spent in the park uh, with wildlife. Badgers were a rarity. They tend to be active at night, so few people see them. And if you're looking for badgers, which I, I was often, um, your best chance is to look for the badger digs, the mounds of dirt, and you can see the dirt mound in this picture, which is next to a hole that's usually about six to eight inches in diameter. And if you watch a hole just before sunrise or sunset, you might see a badger come out of it. But if you've walked the fields in the park, you know that there are lots and lots of those holes and a badger is only going to come out of a handful of them in any given area. So you have to be a little bit lucky in terms of which one um, you watch and whether you get to see a badger. But for some reason this year, 2020, and I have theories about the pandemic and the shutdown and whether that impacted the badger population in the park. But um, I've seen a lot of badgers and spent a lot of time with badgers this year. And this image, um, was taken when the park was truly shut down. So you had to bike or walk in unless you had the handicap placard. And so I was biking in, I had a backpack that I put my camera gear in, I strapped my tripod to and uh, so that I could take video. And I was going into the park. And for me, especially early on in the pandemic, that ability to get outside was just so important for mental health and sanity, um, just the fresh air. And so, I would bike into the park and on this particular afternoon, it was about mid afternoon, I just decided to sit down on a hillside and enjoy being outside and scanning and looking for wildlife and could hear the ocean in the distance and didn't have any particular agenda or anything I was looking for. I was just watching and waiting to see what might go by and grateful, frankly, that I could be outside in the park at all. And as I was looking around, a head popped up out of a hole that wasn't that far from where I was sitting and I realized it was a badger, but then a second head popped out and I realized that the first head that I'd seen was a baby badger, which I had never seen before. And the second head that I saw was the mama badger. And I only had probably less than two minutes with both of them above ground. Um, but this is one of the images I got when they were both up and I just loved the little nuzzle uh, between the baby and the mama. Um, parents and young is one of my favorite wildlife interactions to photograph and observe anytime, uh, but especially a badger, which I had just never seen anything like this before. So both badgers were visible very briefly. And then it, like most wildlife mothers, the mama badger 
wanted to leave and go hunt and the baby badger needs to stay in the den to stay safe and not get eaten. Uh, and so she was trying, basically she had appeared trying to push the baby to go back down into the hole and get it to stay down while she left and went to go hunt. And when other animals, so, so bobcats and coyotes and foxes, the moms do the same thing. They try and get the young to stay in their den site and be safe while the parent goes out, the mom goes out and gets food and brings it back. And in all the animals that I've observed doing this with their young, when it's a fox or a bobcat, there's a growl. They, the mom will turn around and just, I mean, it's sort of, I consider it the equivalent for a human of that stern parenting voice where you take on a different tone and you tell your kids what they need to do right now. Um, in this instance, the mama badger bared all of her teeth and kind of made a grimace and a growl at the baby, which then popped back down in the hole and she went off to hunt. But it was super, super cool to see. And uh, I was able to see them a couple times over the span of about a week and that was it. So um, like many wildlife opportunities, it was um, a fleeting one, but really special to get to see that mother and young together. Ellie, do you have anything in the chat or should I keep going? Um, I don't see any questions in the chat. Okay. No. Well, you mentioned already about the favorite animal. Um, mm -hmm. Tell me about more about other animals that actually are close to your favorite one, aside from the badger. Close to my favorite. Um, so I have an affinity for the predators generally. So bobcats top the list. Gray foxes are probably next and coyotes. Um, and then it's raptors. I love owls. Um, Osprey, which is actually, um, I think the next image, um, the falcons. So, um, but I'm, I, I almost love all of it. I mean, even the badgers and the weasels, I'm excited every time I see them. So there's something wonderful about each of these animals. Yeah. All right, so let's, let's go to the osprey. So, um, as I just mentioned, I really love watching birds of prey and particularly osprey when they're hunting. Um, the amount of patience, the strategies they employ, and just the physical ability. Um, it's just amazing to watch. And so osprey, if you've ever been out either over, a, you know, one of the lagoons or um, along the coast, you see an osprey will circle an area looking for fish. And when they spot one, they rock it downwards with their feet outstretched and grab it. And it's just, it's amazing to see. And so once they catch the fish, which this um, osprey has a jack smelt, they will rotate the fish so that the head is facing forward. So it's more aerodynamic when they fly. And a fun little bit of osprey trivia. So um, birds have generally three toes in front and one behind. Owls and osprey are the only ones where one of those outside toes pivots so it can be two and two for a grip, um, which helps with something like a slippery fish if that's what you have to grab onto. So typically the osprey will then fly in circles until the, um, until the fish is dead and then will land, usually on a high, like a post or a tree to eat it. So on this particular day, I was down on the Tamales Bay and I was watching both osprey and terns um, diving repeatedly for the jack smelt. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw something coming towards me low over the water and realized it was this osprey. And so I stopped, I had been shooting a turn sort of in the other direction. So I turned towards the osprey and from a technical standpoint, shooting something that is flying or running directly at you is difficult because the camera has a hard time focusing on something where the focal distance is changing and especially if that's changing rapidly. So um, I was happy to actually get a few photos that were in focus as this bird came in close. Um, and then in this picture, I love the parallel between the yellow of the osprey eye and the yellow on the jack smelts little gill area. So that just makes me happy from an artistic standpoint. Um, so that's the osprey. Oh no, that's working again, okay. So this is another one of my favorite photos from this year. So this is a young coyote, sort of an older pup. Um, 
And it was just a glorious summer sunset, the kind where the sky turns all different shades of pinks and purples and just beautiful point raise magic. Uh, there's no other word for it. And I was out in the park and actually was in my car driving, looking to see what <laughs> might be able to be photographed in that beautiful light and spotted this coyote. It was a ways off from the road. So I decided to get out of my car and um, again, finding a spot where the angle of the light would be good. And I was far enough away that it would just continue to hunt and walk and not disrupt its behavior. So I, um, I got out and I sat and I watched it. It was hunting coyote, uh, hunting coyotes, hunting gophers, but it unfortunately kept missing. It, it was learning still, uh, but it was super fun to watch. And in this image, a part of what I really like about this photo is the gaze of the coyote and um, the stance, which is sort of both confident and playful. I also really like the contrast between the fur and the sky color. And in terms of artistic composition, there's lots of different ways to look at images and what makes for a high impact in terms of um, placement in the frame and uh, light qualities, but also like the contrast of warm and cool colors and you know, other things like that. And that's true in photography as well as in fine art and painting and things like that. And then with this image, I, um, I actually also have a little bit of the quote studio experience because I was lucky enough to have a friend who's also a photographer who was out there that same evening and he took a picture of me taking a picture of this coyote. So that is me um, on the right hand side and the coyote pup is on the left hand side of the frame. So that's me shooting that coyote pup. So was it just a beautiful sunset out on the coast? One of, one of the well, things that I like, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> We're, we've got a question here in the chat from Laura okay. Stowe uh, asking, do you ever track or watch an area? Do I ever track or watch an area? So um, I mean, certainly I've, so I'm um, sure many of the people on know Richard Vaca and his tracking club and classes. Um, I've gone out with him and read his book and have in fact, at the end of this talk, I have some resources, some different guides and some tracking um, guides. I don't spend a lot of time truly tracking. I mean, um, although I do pay attention to the signs and if I'm looking for a particular animal, I'll look for fresh scat and tracks or like scratch marks, depending on, on what the animal is. Um, and yes, there are definitely areas where I, I've seen something in the past and so I'll go back and see if the animal's habits or patterns stay the same over time. And so there is some, um, some watching of an area that would be sort of consistent for a period of weeks while I'm checking to see if the animal returns or continues the same patterns. Carlos, did you have a question? No, no, go, go ahead. We're doing fine. Okay, then. Uh, let's see. So we're gonna go back to the fox kit. So um, this is a little fox kit. I have to say, I think fox, gray foxes are right under bobcats. I just love them, particularly the fox kits. They are so cute and playful. And they're also really skittish and easily frightened. So photographing fox kit can be very challenging. You have to be in place and be very quiet and very still for usually hours. Um, to get photos, especially of very young um, kits. So this fox den had four fox kits in it and watching them wrestle in the grass and chase each other was just so much fun. But it required, as I said, a lot of hours just sitting still waiting for them to come out because as I mentioned with the badger, moms generally are trying to get the young to stay in the den and like an unruly child, they get curious and bored and, you know, decide to poke their head out or start moving. And the older they get, the harder it is to keep them in. Um, this is a relatively young fox kit, but on this particular morning I had set up and I think I'd been there for two or three hours before this little guy poked its 
head out. Um, but what I really love about this image is not just the expression on the kit's face, uh, but the contrast between the fur and then the darkness of the den behind it. Um, so I just love seeing the fox kits and watching them grow up. And now they're running around, um, not quite full grown, but pretty close. And uh, we're really, really lucky. Gray foxes are um, animals that actually prefer to be close to human habitation. And so probably many of you, if not all of you, have gray foxes in your neighborhood if you live in the Bay Area. Um, whether you've seen them or not, they're probably lurking around, um, but they're definitely one of my favorites to see and photograph. Getting a question here in the chat from Joanna asking, um, was the den an abandoned pipe? Um, yeah, it is. It's it's like a culvert. Yeah. So that's a good observation. You notice the rivets and the metal, corrugated almost metal. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Do the eyes on on this little guys change color as they grow up? Um. Carlos, that's an excellent question. I don't know. I know bobcat kittens are born with blue eyes that then change and get dark. I've never seen anything other than um, the dark eyes on a fox kit, but I've never looked into that. You might. Do you know the answer? <laughs> well, well, in most most uh, animals, babies do tend to actually have uh, light blue or blue eyes, or I mean, they right. do change. Most of them do change as they grow up. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I don't. Definitely. I don't they know. A little foxes. blue. These guys look a little blue, and I don't think it's just the the sky. It's hard to tell. Anyway. Yeah. It, no, you're right. Fascinating they to see them change. Yeah. No, it's true. And um, I've seen. I've watched bobcat kittens change their eye color. You know, usually five to eight weeks of age, they shift sort of from that blue color into more of a beige. Um, but I I hadn't paid attention to the fox kids eye color but you're right they do look slightly blue black as opposed to just straight dark so um, interesting interesting question okay um, so uh, now we get to the long-tailed weasel which like peregrine falcons are a challenge to photograph because they really test your reflexes. Weasels are not only fast, but they're really erratic in how they move. And so the long-tailed weasels tend to go down into gopher holes and they'll dive down into one and then pop up out of another, or they'll pop up from one and run across the top of the you know ground and then duck back down in a different hole and it happens so fast and sometimes it's almost like a zigzag as they go through. Uh, so getting photos of long-tailed weasels is another challenge, another high shutter speed um, experience for sure. And I have a lot of photos of long-tailed weasels that only have half the weasel or are out of focus because they're moving so fast. So I'm always really happy when I have a good, um, a good weasel image, but they're just so cute with their little teddy bear ears and whiskers. Uh, they're adorable, but they're actually really ferocious um, and strong hunters. And they will generally, so they hunt gophers and then they drag them and the gophers practically, it's not as long as the weasel, but gophers are much rounder. Um, and so it's really something to watch this skinny, long little weasel dragging a big round gopher um, along the ground. So. They're really cool animals. Um, most of the time when I take a weasel photo, it's actually sort of a happy accident in the sense that I've gone out either with nothing in mind or more often I've gone out and seen something else out in a field. So I'm looking you know, at a bobcat or a burrowing owl or something else to photograph and haven't gone out specifically to find or photograph weasels. And I've been photographing a burrowing owl and turned around and had a weasel 10 feet behind me. And I've gone out to shoot the tule elk and turned to the side, seen a little movement in my peripheral vision and seen a weasel off to the side. So they are um, a little bit of a surprise factor sometimes when I get to shoot them, but um, they always make me smile. They're just really, really fun to shoot. So um, unless we have any questions about that, we can move into the next. Well, I 
I like to add some. I like to add something to this particular photo subject. Uh, very recently, okay. very recently, Sarah was uh, 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 sent uh, a one of her photos of a weasel to a contest from a national level, and actually got uh, on the top 250 uh, photos of a 1,350 photos that were sent. Uh, and I just wanted to actually pat her in the back and give her some kudos on it. Oh, thank you, Carlos. Yeah, that was super exciting. I was really honored by that. Thank you. Yeah, the weasels are really a fun thing to photograph and fun thing to see. So, okay. So the next image. Um, so this is a roly poly river otter is what I call this. Um, so this is a river otter pup. And like many mammals, otters will take a dust or a sand bath. It's a way to try and control or eliminate parasites by rolling in the dirt. So uh, the day that I took this photo, I was driving and I saw a mom and an otter pup in a pond. So I parked and got out and watched them for a little while from a distance and then decided to try and find a spot along the bank that I could just sit quietly and observe them. And when I'm trying to find a spot to sit, I, like I said, I, I usually will try and find something to sit against. So a bush, a rock, a tree trunk, something that I can sort of visually blend in with. Um, in this instance, there was a little bit of a flat bank area and then like almost like a little, oh, it's not really a cliff, but a little bit of a shelf behind it and a little bit of brush. And so I backed myself up against the um, back of the cliff area and next to a bush and just sat and watched. The um, mom and the um, pup were both hunting crayfish in the pond and diving and swimming and occasionally wrestling. And at one point I was surprised, I looked up and the pup was swimming more or less directly towards me and came up out onto the bank right near where I was sitting and then actually came up higher to literally, as you can tell, he was level with where I was sitting and decided to start rolling in the sandy dirt. And I just loved what happened. The face that you can only really see like the eyes and the nostrils and the whiskers and everything else is just covered in this dirt. I just, it's river otter pups are so playful. Um, they multiple pups, they chase each other and wrestle. I mean, they're just, they're very playful animals. And this little guy rolling around in the sand just again, made me smile. Um, eventually mom came out of the water and came over to where the river otter pup was and made it clear to the pup that it was time to get back in the water. And so she got it to go back in and they continued hunting for um, crayfish, but it was really fun to have him come out and roll next to me for a while. And it's amazing talking about them hunting for crayfish. One of the things I've really noticed when I go out and sit with wildlife is just how much of their time and energy is spent looking for food and hunting for food because that's the process of survival. It's calories expended and calories consumed. And the number of hours that they spend trying to find and consume calories is really, it's most almost of the waking hours. And so it's really, it's interesting to see that. but just a good reminder that for the wildlife that I'm seeing or that you see when you go into the park, every minute is really about survival um, every day, um, trying to stay alive and make it to the next day and to create another generation. Um, so that's, um, that's the uh, river otter pup. So Laurel, do you have any questions about that? Yeah, there's a question here in the chat um, asking, do you sometimes video things like fox kit or uh, otter pup play? I do. Um, so again, I, I love to learn and I'm still learning. I'm still learning a lot about wildlife. I'm still learning a lot about photography. Um, I would say about a year and a half ago, I started doing more video. Um, it's one of the reasons I carry two camera bodies most of the time so that I can take video on one of the two DSLRs. Um, and I do have video of fox kits and of uh, river otters. Um, I also have taken a lot of video of bobcats and bobcat kittens. Um, so um, it is another skill that I'm, I'm building, but I do enjoy. 
Awesome. And we have we have another um, comment question here in the chat. Okay. Um, it says stunning images, Sarah. Did you have photography skills when you started photography <laughs> photographing wildlife, or did you learn on the fly? Um, I didn't No, I really didn't have, I mean, I've, I've sort of always liked photography, but I didn't have any classwork, any formal training, you know, was pretty much shooting on auto settings. I mean, I wasn't in any way, um, trained in it. And I, I'm somebody who tends to, when I focus on something, get pretty determined. And so I really decided to get much more knowledgeable and have spent a lot of time learning about photography. One of the things that's really nice is actually how much is available online. There are some great classes um, and there's some great um, bloggers and um, online journals. And so a combination of, you know, taking online classes and reading different guides and materials and then it's always super helpful, any new passion or pursuit to have mentors and to have people who have been doing it for a while, who have knowledge. And I've been super fortunate to have both Carlos Parada and Daniel Dietrich provide so much information and support for me in these last five years that it's been, it's been a really exciting journey, but I've, I've been learning as I go. <clears throat> So any other, any other questions in the chat, LA? I don't see any questions in the chat, but I, I actually had a question. Um, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm hearing that there's a lot of, you know, you're talking about blending in and everything, like not being too noticed by the animals, but I'm wondering if you have any, you've had any situations where the animal sees you and is interested in you and wants to interact with you. Um, yeah. That's a great question. Um, I would say that I haven't had um, I haven't had an experience where I thought the animal wanted to interact with me per se, but I have had situations where I think an animal has been curious about my gear, and that's happened twice. Um, once. I was shooting peregrine falcons and I had my tripod because when they are on a nest or in a, in a fixed place, um, sometimes I'll shoot on the tripod, but the minute the falcons start flying, they're moving way too fast to have the camera on the tripod. And so in this particular instance, I had my tripod set up and had walked away from it and was carrying my camera and shooting um, while they were, I think there was a food exchange, but anyway, there were a number of falcons flying overhead and then one of them came down to the level where I was and basically like buzzed the tripod. Like I have a picture that I took with my, cause I have my camera in my hand. I have a picture of the Falcon flying within like three inches of my tripod, like at ground level. I actually thought it was gonna land on the, um, the gimbal head I have is kind of like an L shape. So it could almost be shaped like a perch. And for a split second, I thought the Falcon was actually gonna land on the tripod, which would have been an amazing, funny photo, but it didn't stop. It flew right by it, um, but really in close proximity, which I thought was interesting. Um, and the other time I had a wildlife come close to my gear was a bobcat. I was shooting a bobcat and um, I often, in the photos I've shown, I'm often sitting down um, or kneeling, but I also often am lying down like on the ground while I'm taking photos. And in this particular instance, I was lying down in the grass taking photos of Bobcat and I had both cameras in my hand and I decided I wanted to move to a better angle for the light. And I just grabbed my camera with the bigger lens and scooched myself, I don't know, maybe 10 or 12 feet over and just left my other camera sitting in the grass. and. I was shooting the bobcat and all of a sudden she was grooming and licking herself and then stopped and stood up. And I realized she was walking more or less directly towards me. But as she got closer, she walked straight over to where my camera was and sniffed the camera and then sat right next to it and continued grooming. And I only had my big lens. And so I actually couldn't take a picture of it because the focal distance was, it was so close. Um, but I have my cell phone in my back pocket. And so I have both video of her grooming next to the camera. And I took a couple of pictures with my phone of the cat next to my camera, but I've never had an animal approach me. And, 
I mean, not in a, in a desire to interact with me. I've had them walk by or fly by relatively close, but just like I'm between point A and point B and they're going from one to the other. And so they'll go by me without ever pausing or interacting with me. And really it's detrimental to wildlife to interact with humans. Um, seeing humans as a source of food um, will create conflict um, potentially, <laughs> and also creates a greater risk for car strikes and things like that. If they start hanging out by the road, thinking that people will feed them. Um, there's, um, there was a bobcat that ended up having to be euthanized because people had been feeding it near a trailhead and then it it started, it was starving. It didn't ever learn to hunt properly and ended up scratching and hikers. And anyway, long story short, it ended up getting euthanized and people in part because people had been feeding it and disrupted its natural patterns. So you never want to attract wildlife. Thank you for that. Um, and there's actually a question that kind of uh, feeds into that, talking about ethics. Um, Laura says the ethics issue is interesting. I hadn't thought of that before. Uh, is there an issue in the profession of baiting and other questionable ethics? And then a follow-up would be, are there rules for photography contests and publishing? Um, yes. Um, so um, there are guides. So um, NAMPA, the North American Nature Photographers Association, um, does have field guide um, that includes ethics. Um, baiting, generally baiting happens with owls and people buy pet store mice and then sit them on top of the snow and have owls come in. Um, there are also sometimes um, predator situations that people will put out dead things for um, certain predators to come and more or less perform to come eat. Um, but so that's generally not viewed as acceptable. Um, calling is a little bit more of a mixed thing. I think Audubon officially says that a bird call is okay, but only once and you're not to harass a bird. Um, different contests have different rules um, about what you're allowed to do in order to obtain an image, but there are definitely ethical guidelines for um, different organizations for photographers and for different contests. <clears throat> and then any I will funny, any funny stories, Sarah? Funny stories. Well, um, let's see. Other than the uh, bobcat sniffing my camera, um, <laughs> the weasel go <GoPro. laughs> Yeah, the weasel go <laughs> <laughs> so funny oh my gosh that's too funny um so um yeah there are there are lots of probably funny moments um where you're surprised by an animal that you think you know what it's going to do and it does something different um i had a recent damp experience um, out at the beach. I was photographing a gull and it was eating something right at the edge of the water and I was trying to figure out what it was. And eventually I realized it was um, a very small halibut. And I see the gull eating the halibut. And so I was lying in the wet sand because that's what I do when I photograph birds at the beach. And um, all of a sudden, as I'm photographing the gull, I notice the gull pick the fish up and start running up the beach, which in my head, I'm thinking, this is a great photo. Like I've got a gull running with a little halibut in its mouth. This is pretty cool. And my normally sort of sharp peripheral vision was not focusing on what was happening around me, nor did I start thinking, why is the gull running up the beach? And the answer was there was a wave that was coming higher up than the prior waves. <laughs> And lucky for me, I was shooting with, I had my backpack on the ground and my camera on top of my backpack. So when the wave was, and it was low, this was not like a crashing wave. This was just the ebb, you know, just a little bit, you know, probably an inch or two of water. But so when it hit me and the backpack, I jumped up, grabbed my camera and backpack. My shoes were full of water. My jeans were wet. My coat was wet. The iPhone turns out to be waterproof after all, because it was in my coat pocket. Uh, but um, the gear was all dry and that was really all I cared about was that my gear stayed dry. But it was a good reminder that when whatever you're photographing starts running, you should probably look and see why. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> so um, I do have, I put a slide up on the screen just while we were talking about that. Um, in case people are interested in wildlife um, guidebooks or tracks and scat um, guides, these are just some books that I've found really helpful in learning more. And so I thought if people were interested, um, it might be good to have some references. So it's just a quick little reference list about wildlife guides. Awesome. And it looks like we have one more question. This is probably, we probably have time for well, this question and maybe one other, um, but I just wanted to share it since it's in the chat. Um, okay. It says, wonderful images. I'm curious if you have a top bucket list animal that you would want to spend time with. Oh, that's a really great question. Um, the problem for me is my bucket list is like a giant bucket. <laughs> <laughs> There's lots of things I really want to photograph. Um, I was really lucky uh, in November of 2019, I went up to Churchill and got to photograph polar bears, which was amazing. Um, I would love uh, to go to Africa and photograph some of the big cats. Um, closer to home, I'm currently obsessed with some owl options, um, short-eared owls and great gray owls. So those are probably <clears throat> top list um, locally. So I, I have a question, Sarah. How can people buy your prints? Uh, well, so the prints that are for sale um, in the Dance Palace Gallery are all in a gallery on my website. So if you go to my website and scroll down to the bottom of the page, there's uh, the image of the Coyote Puppet Sunset and it says Dance Palace Gallery. And if you click on that, all the images in the gallery on the Dance Palace website are there and you can buy them. You can buy prints, you can buy metal, um, which is actually my favorite way, I think, to display the photographs, but you can also do canvas wraps. So there's lots of different options and <clears throat> a significant amount of the profits go to the Dance Palace. So it's a great, a great way to support this awesome local organization. 2020 has been really tough for nonprofits all around um, as programs have had to be either cut or dramatically shifted in this crazy year that we've had. So supporting your local organizations is really important. Any way everyone can do that, it's great. So this is Bill coming for Sarah's dad. Sarah went to Africa when she was about 12 and saw the amazing nature of Africa. And we'll go again, but countries like South Africa and Botswana have a diversity of life that are so important for everyone to preserve. And um, for all of you who have children, teach them the value of life. Well said. Thanks, Dad. Uh, <clears throat> so um, it seems like we're starting to get to that time. Um, there is a couple of things that I want to actually add that I think is, uh, is important to say. Um, Sarah, very soon on the 20th uh, at 11 o'clock in the morning, will be having a uh, a program for kids on wild dogs and wild cats up Point Reyes. And so all of you that have kids and grandchildren that enjoy wildlife, um, please join us to uh, enjoy uh, Sarah's presentation. Um, I also wanna add uh, that uh, in uh, January, we're having uh, Sydney Bardo uh, uh, and her Zoom reception will be held on January 16, 2021. It'll actually um, be, her, sorry to jump in and interrupt, it'll be the 24th, January 24th for Oh, uh, so I messed it up. It's a week later. Uh, <laughs> yes, she has exquisite quilts and uh, it'll be an exhibit at the Dance Palace. Um, I want to thank Sarah. Uh, Sarah, you've done, you've done a great job. Um, I'm so proud of you. Um, it's a wonderful, wonderful program you have done. Um, and so, and, and I want to thank everybody to actually have, that has taken the time to actually join with all of us to enjoy some of Sarah's work. Um, it's really actually wonderful. 
wonderful. Congratulations. And thank you so much to everybody yeah. for joining us. If, if I can just jump in and add to the gratitude, um, I really appreciate everyone who joined this afternoon. It's been really fun. I would love to see you all in person and give you hugs and say hello, but this has been really great. Um, I do want to also thank, there's a note on the bottom of the screen that's up, but all the photos and video of me that were in this um, little slideshow presentation were taken by Daniel Dietrich. So a thank you to him for taking pictures of me. Photographers prefer to be behind the camera and not in front of it. So it's a little bit of a stretch to have some pictures of me taken, but it was, I think, nice to have them for this. And um, Laurel Ann and Carlos and everybody at the Dance Palace, thank you again for everything you did to make this show happen and make this reception happen. It's super exciting to have one and to be able to share stories and images with our community. So thank you so much. And uh, I hope everyone stays healthy and sane for the rest of 2020. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Carlos. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And thank you uh, once again to the Dance Palace Art Committee. Um, if you have kids, we'll see you on uh, January 20th for Sarah's uh, Kid Cats and Dogs event. And um, we'll see you next month for, for the next art show. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Have a good afternoon. <laughs> thank you. Go, go. Good job, Sarah. Good job, Sarah. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Bye. <laughs>